Well, I want you to imagine with me, uh, there was a, a little girl, a little bit older than Joyana, and uh, she went into a store with her mother. While in the store, this little girl wandered over to the toy department, as children will sometimes do, and she finds a doll that she just falls in love with, and she wants that doll so badly. She says to her mom, Mom, please get me the doll. I want this doll more than anything I've ever wanted, ever, Mom. And of course, the mom says, Honey, we didn't come into this store to buy toys. I'm not going to buy you a toy. But she says, You don't understand, Mom. I really want this doll. I love this doll. I wanted more than I've ever wanted anything in my whole life. And if you'll get me the doll, I'll be grateful for the rest of my life. I'll never, ever ask for anything, not ever again. And so the mother buys her the doll. And it works just like the little girl said it would. She grows up to be a very joyful, very grateful very contented person in spite of severe obstacles in her lives. Later on, she marries a husband who turns out to be a real louse. He abandons her with three children. The three children turn out to be a huge disappointment. They move to California. And when she is quite old, Social Security runs out and she has to live literally hand to mouth, hand to mouth to take care of herself. But you know what? She never complains because she got that doll. The doll brought her such lasting satisfaction. She was grateful right up to the very end of her days. Question, does life really work that way? No, no, of course it doesn't work that way. That's why we chuckle at the silliness of a story like that. So then why are little children so foolish? Why are they so incredibly deceived? Why would they think that just acquiring something or altering their external circumstances would produce lasting gratitude and joy? How can little children be so foolish, so stupid? How? Well, then you have to ask another question. Is this just a problem for little children, or is this problem bigger than something that just affects little children? You know, I'll be satisfied and gratified when I graduate from school. I'll be satisfied and grateful when I get a good job. I'll be satisfied and I'll be a really grateful person when I find a spouse and when I get married. I'll be satisfied, I'll be grateful when I finally have a child. I'll be satisfied and grateful when I get to live in just the right house and just the right neighborhood. I'll be satisfied and grateful when I make, you know, this amount of money, just a little more money than I currently make. I'll be satisfied and grateful when I have this particular car or drive this particular truck. I'll be satisfied and grateful when I have this watch, this computer, this phone, this pair of shoes, this pair of pants, this dress. It's the I'll be satisfied and grateful when syndrome. That's what we're talking about this morning. Here's the choice. You can say, I'll be satisfied and grateful when, and then just fill in the blank, right? Or you can say, I will be satisfied and grateful now, period. You see, it's your choice, really. And many people choose the when option. They go their whole life long saying, I'll be satisfied, I'll be grateful when, and they never realize there is no doll that good. It's your choice. I will be satisfied. I will be grateful when, or I will be satisfied. I will be grateful now. And this brings us to the story of another whole group of children, namely God's children as they wandered in the wilderness. In Exodus 15, as we pick up the story, the people of Israel have been delivered from Egypt. Imagine. Remember, they had been in slavery for a very long time, perhaps even hundreds of years. And they thought to themselves, you know what? If we could just ever be free, wow, that's what we want. That would make us happy. We'd be forever grateful. That would be so satisfying. We haven't had our freedom for as long as any of us can remember. And so Exodus 2, we read that the Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God hears their cry. He listens. He's moved. 
And he begins to work. He begins to work behind the scenes. And then this, this, this amazing thing happens. The children of God are freed from the Pharaoh's oppression. And you know the story. The Pharaoh pursues them. Once he lets them go, he decides that was a bad decision. And he goes after them with his chariots. But God destroys Pharaoh's army. The, the Israelites pass through the Red Sea, but not the Pharaoh, not his chariots. So not only now are they free, but God also miraculously destroys their enemies. So now they have security, safety from their enemies and freedom. No one's chasing after them to kill them. And now they're on their way to the land that God has promised them, a land flowing with milk and honey. So surely they are grateful and satisfied now and will be for the rest of their lives, right? Well, Exodus 15, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. And so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made a decree and the law for them. There he tested them. So now they've got freedom, they've got security, they've got safety, and they've got sweet water to drink. Surely now they will be satisfied and grateful for as long as they live. Well, we read that the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Wow. They have raised the art of complaining and grumbling to, grumbling to you know, a whole new level. If only God could have killed us back in Egypt, they say, given us a quick death back then when our bellies were full, right? That would have been better than this. God intervenes again. It says that evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? That, by the way, is actually the word manna. The word manna translated simply is that question, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Manna is an amazing food we find out. It's life-sustaining. We're told elsewhere that it tastes like wafers with honey. And so God not only makes it nourishing, he makes this thing for them to eat every day. He makes it good, taste uh, something that tastes good. He makes it a food that can be baked. It's a food we're told that can be boiled. It's a very versatile food. It's like that Forrest Gump thing. You remember that, right? Bubba describing all the ways to fix shrimp. You remember that? Man is like, you know, you can bake it, you can boil it, you can have it uh, barbecued, barbecued manna, grilled manna, manna on a stick, manna burgers, manna salad, manna cotti, manna banana cream pie, all kinds of ways to prepare it. God is gracious to his children and he frees them from slavery. He gives them security and safety from their enemies. He gives them sweet water to drink and now he provides meat and manna. And so now they will be satisfied. They will be grateful for the rest of their lives, right? Well, we read in Numbers 11 that the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Oh, really? Really? Slavery? No cost? Okay. At no cost. Also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Wow. Not satisfied. Not grateful. Over and over and over and over again, they complain and they grumble against Moses and they grumble against God. And this in the face of gift after gift after gift, provision after provision after provision. And the writer of scripture is just very frank about all this. He doesn't sugarcoat the story in one bit. Uh, Here's God's children. They have been delivered from slavery and they are still, they, they sit saying, we remember the good old days, you know, when we ate fish from Egypt. 
from the Nile at no cost and cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. Those were the good old days, they say. And this attitude becomes contagious as ingratitude always is contagious. We read that Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. And he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? He's talking about himself. What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face let me face on my own, on my ruin. Now Moses wants to die. Everybody wants to die. <laughs> this is just grumbling uh, and this is ingratitude and it's how this works. It spreads once it starts. God's children have given in to grumbling and complaining and the next thing you know, even the leaders are grumbling and complaining. And when you get to that place in any organization, any movement, you've really got problems. Now it's not going to be long before all the joy, all the energy, all the motivation in the movement is gone. Everybody just wants to quit. Everybody just wants to go home. Game over. What's the point? Nobody is enjoying this. And when this happens, this destroys the witness, it destroys the health, and it destroys the vitality of God's people every time. And that's why this is a significant issue for us as well, an important issue for us to discuss. I've got a question for you. How would you describe your satisfaction gratitude quotient on a scale of one to 10? You know, 10 being deep satisfaction, deep contentment, deep gratitude for right now in your life. How would you describe, what number would you give your satisfaction gratitude quotient on a scale of one to 10? Think back over the last few, I was going to say months, but really it'd be better if I just said weeks. Uh, how much complaining have you done? Uh, have you complained about money? Have you complained about your weight? Have you complained about your in-laws? Or maybe, maybe the money that your in-laws have. Or maybe your in-laws' weight. Maybe you've complained about that. Or maybe traffic, or maybe it's your health, or maybe it's vacations, or it's a lack of vacation, or it's cars, or it's weather. Did you complain about the weather already today? Have you complained about kids lately, or your job, or your home? Think about how often you grumble and you complain. One to ten. Mass confession. If you've complained about any of these things at all in the last week or two, would you stand up with me? Stand up if you've complained. Some of you are complaining right now. What a dumb idea this is to have to stand up. You're thinking, this is dumb. We shouldn't have to do this. So you can just sit down if you're going to complain. Point is this. Do we agree that we are all in this complaining boat together? This is a relevant subject, I think, for all of us, not just me. Understand something. God takes complaining pretty seriously. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he wants the church to learn from the mistakes that were made by the Israelites when they wandered in the wilderness. And so he writes concerning those mistakes. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. They were always setting their hearts on something other than God. And that's what made those, things. you know, leeks and onions and garlic are not evil. But when you prefer them over God and what God is doing in your life, that's when they become evil, he says. Do not be idolaters, he says, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. That's what happened when they made the idol of the golden calf. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. He's talking about another episode. 
And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. What Paul is saying is he's saying, you know, idolatry. These people committed idolatry and they paid a price, pagan revelry. And we take that idolatry thing pretty seriously here. He said they committed sexual immorality. And, you know, we take that kind of seriously here, sexual immorality. Uh, He said they had willful defiance. In other words, they tested the Lord. That's the language he uses. And we would take willful defiance of God pretty seriously here. But then he mentions grumbling. Grumbling. What do we do with that one? Do we take that pretty seriously here? He says, don't allow yourself to go down the road of grumbling and complaining because that led in Israel's case to death. And you know what? It actually leads to death in ours too. At the very least, it leads to places of death spiritually, places of death in terms of our character, places of death in terms of being an awful and miserable place to live. He's not kidding, Paul. Uh, The fact is in Numbers chapter 11, if you read that chapter, it talks about God bringing judgment on the Israelites for exactly this reason of complaining and grumbling. And people died and they were buried because of this complaining and grumbling. In Numbers chapter 11, it says that the Israelites named that place Kibroth Hatava, Kibroth Hatava, which literally means graves of craving. That place where they were grumbling and they were complaining and death occurred, that's That place they gave the name Graves of Complaining. And the point is just this. You see, their constant craving and discontent led to places of death for them. And I would argue, friends, that constant complaining, constant grumbling is deadly for us as well. There's an author, his name is Robert Hughes. He wrote a book some years ago where he puts forth the argument that in America today, in the United States today, we've tribalized. Everybody's got their own tribe with their own desires, their own wants, their own expectations. And all of these tribes are in competition with one another. The title of the book is called The Culture of Complaint. It's a good book. He says that we have, we live in a culture of complaint. We live in a society where people perceive themselves as being entitled to having all of their desires fulfilled, right? And when that doesn't happen, they then view themselves as victims. They're victims. And they just grumble their way through life. They end up living, as it were, in graves of craving. They spend their whole lives waiting for something to come along to make them grateful, something that will make them happy instead of looking around themselves and choosing to be grateful. Question, how often do you practice, that's the key word, practice, because this is something that you have to practice. How often do you practice giving thanks? The Apostle Paul knew how vitally important this was in the life of somebody who followed Jesus. I would add, too, in the life of any church. This is very important. He wrote to the church at Philippi. He said, do not be anxious about anything. Think about that. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. There it is. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Make your needs known to him from out of the place of thanksgiving. He wrote to the, uh, Timothy, uh, uh, a fellow worker in, in the gospel ministry with him. He said, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Thanksgiving. The point is, I think, that Paul wanted us, wants us to practice giving thanks. Because he knew that this too could be contagious. And it's a good thing. Scripture teaches that gratitude does not come about as a result of external circumstances. You know, things being just right and and everything bad going away in your life, being just the way you want it. Scripture teaches that a life of gratitude is a byproduct of a certain kind of character. It has little to do with external circumstances. So in the remainder of our time, here's what I want to do. I want to run through some questions with you. 
questions that are important for us to answer if we're going to grow in gratitude, if we're going to be a people who learn to practice thanksgiving. Uh, These are questions I think that we've got to answer. So here's the first question. Who do I make responsible for the satisfaction and gratitude quotient in my life? Now, the answer is obvious. The answer is me, or the answer is you. I must take responsibility for the satisfaction and gratitude factor in my life. That's my job. It's not my spouse. It's not my kids. It's not my boss. It's not my neighbors. It's not my teachers. It's not my friend's job to make me grateful. It is my job. You know, if you lead anywhere and you're waiting for those you lead to create gratitude in you, hmm. if you're a parent and you're waiting for your kids, if you're married and you're waiting for your spouse, if you're working and you're waiting for your boss or your job to create gratitude in you, you are going to be waiting forever, friends. I mean that, forever. You see, it's your job to be joyful. It's your job to practice being satisfied, to practice being a grateful person. It's not anybody's job to make you that way. Friends, life is a gift. Do you know that? It is not a right. You should not take the fact that you are alive for granted. You see, if your eyes work, if your heart beats, if your limbs function, if your mind works, it's all a gracious gift from God, not something that you or I are entitled to. You see, every moment that you are alive, every breath that you breathe, whether you know it or not, whether you appreciate it or not, whether you understand it or not, it is actually an expression of the goodness of God toward you, even if you don't appreciate it. Even if you live with pain, it's still a good thing to have the gift of life. So to think that your joy or your gratitude are in the hands of another or to think that you are entitled to something different than you have, something better than you currently have, I would say to you that is wrong thinking. Your gratitude and your joy and your satisfaction are your responsibility. Second question, when should I practice gratitude? Well, again, the Bible is clear on this. Uh, Today is the day to practice gratitude. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. Paul wrote to a church in Colossae and he said, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the father through him, through Jesus. He wrote to a church at Thessalonica and he said, be joyful always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 118, the psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist does not say yesterday, that was the day yesterday. Oh man, that would have been the day for rejoicing. We were happy yesterday. Nor does he say, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow will be the day that God will make when everything is good for you. Everything lines up just the way you want it to be and you will get everything you want. It's not yesterday and it's not tomorrow. It's today. So the question is, what are you waiting for? You see, if we think we need to wait for something to come along and make us happy and grateful, tell me, what could that possibly be? Would it be a a new car or a raise or a spouse or a new spouse or a new job or a new house or a doll of some kind? What would it possibly be? Friends, we are sadly deceived if we're waiting on that kind of stuff to make us grateful. Gratitude is something you have to practice. It's something you need to practice today. Because this is the only day we've got, right? I mean, yesterday's gone. It's not coming back. Tomorrow isn't here yet. It might not come for some of us, right? I'm looking at some of you. I'm thinking that. It might not come. You only have now, this moment, right now, to rejoice and be glad and to give thanks for the good things you have. It's got to be now, you see. Next question. What should I be thankful for? 
The Bible's really clear about this too. Paul the apostle says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, now understand, Paul is not saying that you glibly thank God for horrible things or that you you know, casually thank God for sinful things, for tragedies in your life. There are things we are supposed to mourn. We all know this. Paul wrote to the church at Rome and he said, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Paul isn't saying rejoice over evil, rejoice over bad stuff. That's not what he's saying. What he's really saying is that grateful people learn to experience as a gift what other people just take for granted. In other words, they have different eyes. They see the things they have differently than those who are taking things for granted. Paul said, always giving thanks for everything there in Ephesians 5. You see, thankful people thank God for the things that others just expect to receive, you see. Grateful people realize that they are receiving gifts practically every moment of every day. They learn to see them, take joy in them, and be thankful for them. These are the eyes of Jesus. When Jesus was here on earth, he was always seeing things and giving thanks for them and rejoicing in the day that the Lord had made, that his father had made. What should I be grateful for? Well, frankly, a long, long list of things. You ought to make one too. In fact, that would just be your assignment. Make a list. What should be on your list of things that you were thankful for? I did this this week. I took time, got out a sheet of paper. I filled the sheet of paper with stuff I should be and am thankful for. My wife, my kids, my grandkids, my cat. Do you know my cat loves me? I think more than my wife. I mean, <laughs> he follows me around. He wants to be in my lap. I can't remember the last time Holly wanted to be in my lap. But anyway, <laughs> that's a different sermon in a different series. But my church family. You know, I talk to pastors pretty regularly and all too often, I'm sad to say they're not happy about the places they serve or the people they work alongside of. And it's sad. I'm thankful for you all. I really am. And I'm thankful for the people I get to do ministry with in this church. And I'm not just saying that because it sounds good in a sermon. I am really honest to goodness, blessed by getting to pastor in this place with you people. I am thankful for my home. Have you seen my home? It's a palace. It's unbelievable. Uh, I love my bike. I have the best bike in the world. I love the trails I get to ride on. Uh, I am thankful for my health. Uh, There's such a long, long list of things that I put down on my piece of paper, things about which I sometimes I just take them for granted, but I shouldn't. I should be thankful. What about you? What needs to be on your list? Have you taken time lately to create such a list? Here's another question. What about when I'm disappointed? And that happens to all of us, happens all the time. Well, should I practice gratitude then, even when I'm disappointed? And the answer I would say is still yes, but it's a qualified yes. Let me explain. You see, when we're disappointed, sometimes we need to practice kind of a a defiant gratitude if you will. Uh, The prophet Habakkuk, an Old Testament prophet in Israel's history, he happened to live in a a very, very difficult period of time. It was a period of time when Assyria had been oppressing Judah, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom's gone. And because God was giving him visions and so on, he saw the day and the day wasn't very far off. It was actually very close. The day when Babylon was going to attack Judah and overrun it, and take it captive and take literally tens of thousands of people from Jerusalem and from Judah into captivity into Babylon. And Habakkuk sees this, this dark day ahead and, and understand too, this was of course an agrarian society. Everything depends on the crops that you produce, uh, the grapes that you grow, the, the herds that you have, the, the meat that is uh, out there in the field. And uh, this is what Habakkuk writes, in spite of the dark days that he sees coming, he says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet, he says, 
I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He's got a different set of eyes. He says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. You see, things are not going well, not in this description that Habakkuk gives. But he says, yet. Habakkuk determines to practice a kind of defiant gratitude, if you will. And the truth is, friends, gratitude in this world, this fallen world, will always be gratitude in spite of something. Am I right? It just always will. Now, I know that there are some here this morning that are perhaps in deep places of pain. Maybe you're in a place of suffering, a place of difficulty, a place of hardship. You're there right now, today. And you're wrestling with some huge personal loss or disappointment. Please understand that when that is your reality, of course you have to grieve it. You're supposed to mourn it. You have to acknowledge it. You don't deny it. You don't pretend like it's not real or it's not happening. You don't pretend to be happy in it. You grieve, you mourn. Most importantly, you go to God with it over and over and over. That's how life works for a disciple, for a follower of Jesus. But I would say this also, don't give it one ounce more power in your life than has to be given to it. That's this defiance thing I'm talking about. Don't allow that sadness, whatever it is, to keep you from receiving the joy that you can still have. The joy from knowing God. The joy from knowing he is with you. He will get you through this. You see, that takes a measure of defiance. That's what I'm talking about. People sometimes think that if God wants me to be grateful and joyful, why doesn't he just give me everything I want? Why doesn't he just remove all of the sad stuff from my life? Well, parents know the answer to this. Am I right? Uh, Is the best way to raise a child who's truly grateful just to give him or her everything that child wants? What does that produce? That produces a monster, right? You gratify every whim of that child. You remove every obstacle for that child. You're creating a monster. You see, here's the truth. Because of who God is and how big God is and how wise God is, the truth is that sadness and frustration, and failure, and hardship, and disappointment, and consequences in our lives, all of these things are critical ingredients for the development of character. And God is so big, he can use all of that stuff, perhaps none of it good, but he can use all of that stuff to cause good things to happen in us as we hold on to him, as we trust him, as we have faith in him. He can even develop a grateful heart in us. These things can teach us that it is possible to have an unfulfilled desire and still survive, even have joy, even have gratitude with unfulfilled desires. We need to learn that we're not at the mercy of our unfulfilled desires. I fear sometimes that people these days think that human beings are little more than just bundles of desires waiting to be filled, right? Feed me, love me, care for me, provide for me, satisfy me sexually, make me happy. And if you do a good job, well, I might just be joyful. I might just be grateful. That's a sure fire formula for misery. It's back to what we said in the beginning. Living life with the illusion that if I just had Whatever it is, a really cool car, a really nice house, a great job, a different spouse, a nicer dog, better kids, well, then I would be grateful. I hope you see that that's just not true. That wasn't true for Moses. Wasn't true for the Israelites. It's not true for us either. See, the truth is God has already given us an incredible list of things that lead to life, don't you see? He made us in his image. That's what a Christian believes. He loves us. That's what a Christ follower believes. He adopted us into his family. Imagine 
He sacrificed his son Jesus for us so that our sins could be forgiven, so the door of relationship with God could be open. He guarantees our eternity future. He has gifted us with certain abilities, certain skills, certain things that we can use to bless others, to make life meaningful, friends. And he has given us this family, this thing called the church to help us through whatever comes our way when it comes and it's coming. He's given us everything we need to be happy and to be grateful now, right now. He's done all of this in Jesus. We just need to recognize this and choose a life of gratitude and a life of thankfulness. How foolish it is to think, I've just got to have that doll, you see. Circumstances and acquisitions will never create a grateful person, not for very long. Gratitude is something we learn over time with practice and with Jesus. Don't you see, friends, Jesus is it. When you see life through the lens of Jesus, Jesus was always giving thanks. You know, it's interesting to me, Jesus came to this earth with the full knowledge he was going to die for you and for me, right? but he lived a joyful life. He lived a a life trusting in his heavenly father. He did exactly what we need to do. Hold on to, trust in the heavenly father who will never leave us, who will never forsake us, who will always give give us wisdom if we ask and if we listen. There's always a way to live with gratitude, even if it's defiant gratitude. Jesus means for us, his followers, to be grateful people, thankful people, people with eyes to see the good gifts that God is giving us every day in practically every moment. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we, uh, we just confessed to you. A moment ago, uh, we, we were standing and acknowledging that we're all in the same boat on this gratitude thing. Uh, There are things that we receive from your hand every day, but we're not thankful. There are struggles that we experience too, Lord, and we tend to live in them. Or we tend not to bring them to you, or we tend not to trust you in the midst of them. The truth about us is, God, being broken and living in a broken world, we can be pretty ungrateful. We can live with lots of ingratitude We can grumble and we can complain. We see ourselves in the mirror of these Israelites in the wilderness. And God, help us. Let us see life through the eyes of Jesus. Let us see Jesus himself, how he loves us, how he died for us, how he is with us and will never leave or forsake us. Let us see, God, that there's always the opportunity for defiant gratitude, always at least that. Fill us with the perspective that keeps us coming to you with all the things that seem to overwhelm us. Fill us with love and trust and gratitude. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.